Okay, in this video, I'm going to be analyzing my SAL in Woking, where I ran 11.32 uh, with wind. The wind wasn't notated. And 22.85 with plus 2 wind. So, start at 100. That is me. The first thing I want to talk about is my reaction time was actually good. There was, was that even me? Is this me? I can't even tell. That might have been me. We'll see in a sec. I just remember I was near the middle, so it could it could really be either one of those two. Wearing similar shirts. Just figure out which one is actually me. Okay. Okay, I'm the left. I'm on the left. The reaction time was even with everyone else's. I really extended my leg out of the block spot. My real issue came with that back leg. Like always, it comes out and then it cycles up. And everyone else has already taken their second step whilst I'm about to take my second step. Literally everyone. Purely because I did not have a good angle of attack when I was trying to leave the blocks. But other than that, I dried my arms, didn't panic. There wasn't much of a reason to panic anyway. And this is the guy that went, he basically just leaves us all behind. Purely because his technique is superior to the rest of us by a lot. His dry lamps wide, it starts to separate. I end up falling to the back, but I'm pretty sure I end up clutching up because I think I came like third, fourth. Let me see. No, never mind. I came fifth. It was one from the back. I was bound with this guy. In all fairness, the reason why I came fifth and not fourth is because me and this guy. Ran the exact same time. We ran. We both ran eleven three two. The only difference is, I think it was to the hundredth of a second he beat me, and you'll see that when we get to the finish line. I think from this angle anyway. But I'm behind, and then I just power, 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 and I slowly start to catch up. At one point, my knee started to act up, but hey, it happens. I'm about half a stride behind him, and then just start to just move. My stride length is as good as I could want it to be. If you can get this to come on me, I wanted my legs as well, whatever. But the angles that I'm making from this position are anything but bad. You can see 90 degrees. We could probably get this up higher to about 100 ish, which would make a difference a small difference would seem seemingly but no big big difference but nothing wrong with having a 90 degree angle on my right side on my left side my left side should probably be lower because it usually is i just haven't probably figured out how to extend at the time Oh, actually, we look good. I ran this because of when I decided to do it compared to the other one. But, anywho, they're about the same. My arms are pumping. My shoulders are tense like they always are. But I'm getting the stride length that I normally do without much issues. The only difference is... The only difference between this race for the 100 and the race that I had in the other one was... I think it was my frequency... My frequency in the other race was the best, but the reaction time ruined it. Whilst this time, the frequency has drastically gone down. It's gone from 4.31, which was even with the slow reaction, to 4.24. However, in exchange for the drop from 4... Point three one. There's a point there. Just imagine this there. Two. Um. Four point two four. There was a benefit that came from that, which was with this race here, I was able to do two. That's a zero oh four um, meters for every stride on average. Whilst on this one, we got. 0.8 which is obviously a massive benefit though the drop between the frequency here and where it was before here is a bit too big 
realistically, we should have been somewhere in the middle of this. I'd say that or maybe an eight would have been sufficeable to be good. But eleven three two isn't too bad. And I just really just clawed my way from the back, really. The technique was good. We landed on a central mass. The only real problem I had was, again, my knee. But, hey, happens. Not that big of a deal. And then you usually just see right here. I think I dipped early by a small amount, whilst this guy dipped immaculately last minute. You can see right there. I'm already starting to dip now. And he dips slightly after me. Then you see that he dips. And he dips again. Which I don't know how he did that. And from the side angle, because I don't have it on this one, but from the side angle, you literally used to see his chest just inch out ahead of me by the smallest amount. And we both ran 11.32, and the person who won ran 11 or 10.6. Now, on to the 200, the more interesting race. There is me, and we ran 22.85, which considering the fact that I was fatigued from five days prior and my knee was injured and it actually buckled in the race that's a really good time to run but you're going to quickly notice that i actually wasn't supposed to run this time originally things weren't looking good so i'm just going to quickly play this in sort of like slow motion but you can see i'm going i'm going i'm going things are about normal until about here my knee buckles and i'm starting to get left behind and some of these guys are going to be running 21, understandable, but most of them didn't. This guy was the one that won. But me behind this guy in orange, I was about to run a 23. There was no chance that I would be able to run a 22 with how I'm coming around a bend behind people who were about to run a 22, a high 22. Or a low 22, doesn't matter. And this guy, I think he just about broke 22, broke into 22 for this, which is a bit weird because fun fact, his PB is the fastest out of everyone. He just didn't have it on a day to run. And it was all around here where things changed. But before we get to that, let's just go all the way back to the start and actually talk about what happened. So again, here I am, come out the blocks. And I cycle out, but different from before, so no, actually not the exact same as before. My second leg also just cycles out as well. And I'm driving, 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 driving. I can feel this guy on my back from right here. Right here, I remember, or I could feel him on my back. And I, was, I knew that if I don't get around this bend and I'm not at least slightly behind him or even, things aren't going to go very well for me. And it was right here, um, this leg right there. The knee buckled and you just see him fly. Maybe it was one step before that, though. I've been right here. My knee buckles and he just flies by me. And there's nothing. Yeah, it was that, this step right here. My knee buckles. You can literally even see it. Kind of see it sunk. Whereas we go back one more step. On, okay, let's go forwards. Like, he's kind of in the way. So right there. You can see the angle of my leg. I don't even have to paid that much attention to it but you can see the angle of this leg pretty much straight then if you go forwards it's back to my left leg one more time Ooh, is it here oh that's the wrong leg though that's fine really hard to see Now I've literally been behind that barrier, and this is this one. But the knee did buckle, and if you go back in the video to that specific point, you'll be able to see it, because I can't find it for some reason again. But the knee buckled, and he just starts to move away from me. And I had to change my race strategy a bit to slow down to accommodate, because I didn't want to make my knee explode, because it, it literally buckled and twisted, and I was a bit worried that I was going to, be over for me, but I come around the bend still somehow. Everyone comes around really hard, and I'm just coming around last minute right here. And right right here is where I remembered something that my coach told me called popping your hips, which is something that I kind of can do at times, but I don't do properly. 
And just like how I said in my previous analysis video, how the difference between me and the guy who won in 21-3 was the height of our hips. If I'm able to put my hips, my hips would go from this high to maybe that high, maybe a bit less. Uh, an obvious amount, very obvious amount. And if I'm able to do that, that's more vertical force, which means a higher top speed and a higher top speed will be given to me, not because I'm increasing my frequency, but because I'm increasing my stride length. And if you just look carefully, you can kind of just look, pay attention to my shoulders, in fact. You can see me start to wobble left, right, left to right. And that's because I'm trying to pop the hips, try and rise. And as I put my hips to start to rise, you just see my legs open up more and I'm driving. Because now my hips are in a higher angle. Originally, I was a meter behind this guy in blue. But three, four steps later, one, two, three, four, one, six, seven, eight. So eight steps later, sorry. We're right next to each other. 10 steps later, I'm slightly in front of him. 12 steps later, I'm clearly in front of him. 14 steps later, it's over. And you can really see it from here. Just look at the angling of my legs. These are body positions that I've never hit in my life prior to this. My body is just whipping really well, focus on the legs, specifically the back leg. So the one that's on the floor, watch how it just goes behind me and then it just cycles up and comes through really quick and the leg in front lands underneath my center of mass i'm extending really wide and we're just going <laughs> and for those of you that have seen my other analysis videos then you know that i have a problem where my the other leg actually this leg isn't able to come up as high when i'm trying to sprint at top speed but that didn't happen in this race both legs were coming up high and i'm having a wide stride length and not just a back side stride length because this is mainly front side dominant which you can see by the ease i'm able to just bring my legs through quick because the easiest way to tell if you're extending your legs the right amount is by how far away your hip displaces from under your center of mass you generally want your hip to stay probably around in line with this line but it's going to push back slightly back naturally as you come off the floor think of it like an elastic band but once that leg starts to come up this part the hams and quads they're gonna recoil back in really quick then the, the shank is just gonna come through really fast and you're not gonna have any problems with your stride which is why it's front side whilst if you look at this guy the guy who i beat last minute let's just rewind back to him that you can see him really well was it this step look you can see he's kind of struggling to bring his leg through and that's clear by the fact that there's a gap between both of these knees he's overstriding because his backside is too much because his backside mechanics are happening too much he's not able to bring the leg through because quite frankly this guy has no stride length at all compared to him who has a wide stride length like we just show it He's running this like this is 100 meters, essentially. There's not much stride. But this guy lost to him purely because he's overstriding. So there's more ground contact time than he needs to be. Whilst me, we're just whipping underneath. And if we look, even look at my ground contact time. So we hit the ground at 21. Point seven two. Imagine there's a point there. And we leave the ground. I think you could call that. We leave it. I'm pretty sure I'm off the ground. Should be off the ground by there. And I leave the ground by 21.175. Which means every single one of my steps is zero. Point one zero three. Generally, you want to get your ground contact time below point one to be sprinting at elite times. And the fact that I haven't isn't crazy because I'm only running twenty two. But the fact that I'm so close to point one on the dot 
is amazing. The frame rate isn't too good, so maybe I am, but I highly doubt it. But the fact that I'm able to do this, which is really important, is the fact that I'm able to have such a low ground contact time whilst having a stride length as wide as this is impressive. Because if you, you can get a ground contact time like this relatively easily if you chop your steps. I'm sure this guy over here, he has a very similar ground contact time to me. But the difference is, my stride length is way wider than his, so I'm actually able to travel further than him. The only reason why he beat me in the end and I came, what was it, third, no, fourth, is because I ran out of real estate. There was no more space for me to catch this man because right the line, I was about here, in between these two lads, him, him, and him. And if I started doing this, let's say five meters earlier, I would probably have ended up literally right there. So if he, he could have dipped and beat me just like how the other guy in the 100 did, but I probably would have been going faster, so I probably wouldn't have had much of a problem catching him. But if we look at this other guy's ground contact time, let's not look at the guy with the tiny strides, let's look at the guy with the big strides. So hit 20.868, please. I'm not going to write it out. It takes too long to write. And he's off. Let's, let's, let's even say he's off here, which he isn't clearly, but let's say he is. His ground contact time is 0 0.122. And do you guys have the numbers as well? The numbers, they're clearly just there. So if you want to check that and to see if I'm lying or not, you can. But that is a big difference to have because that is about. 0.018 I think something like that and the fact that he's spending that much more time on the ground adds up which is why I was able to catch him from behind the only person who was a struggle to deal with is this guy because by the time I started doing this he was already 50 meters down the track so whether I could have caught him or not is questionable and I'll be honest probably wouldn't have happened but if we look at our techniques his and mine You'll see that the way we sprint is both very similar now. He's kind of always striding a bit. Not actually, no, I don't think he is. But his, his angle is a bit weird, so he's not able to produce as much power as he could. But you can see the way we sprint is very front side. You'd almost think that we're from the same club, based off of just the fact that our, our bibs are both blue, which is a different club, but similar. But you can, you'd even might even assume we're trained by the same coach because of how similar our running styles are here compared to whatever was going on for the first hundred where I don't know what I could tell you but the reason why this final hundred was so well and for reference I actually ran this final hundred anywhere between 10.5 and 10.7 the reason compare that to about 12.3 to 12.1 for that first hundred if you because my knee buckled you can clearly tell that I changed my race strategy to be able to succeed here. And the thing that actually changed was I opened up. And I opened up more than I ever have, even more than I did in my PB race for the 200. Because if I was able to run the first 100, not even well, just without any knee problems, and then I decided to do this for the final 100, I would have PB'd. I would have PB'd. And I'm going to say that the wind actually hindered my PB potential. Because I don't know if it was a crosswind, but I'm going to assume, based off of the simple numbers, that the wind was going in this direction. When you're going around the bend, so let's rewind all the way to the start. <laughs> when you're going around the bend, the wind is coming at you that way. So you can't get as powerful of a start as you want, and that's going to hinder you. And the start takes up the most amount of energy, so having that happen is just anything but good. And right here, you're turning into the bend and the wind's doing everything it can to try and make you go in that direction. And that's just not going to help you run fast. The only time the wind helps you is about here. So I would say whilst the wind was plus two, I probably reacted as if it was plus one wind because I just couldn't run properly fast with wind that heavy. And around the straight, I don't even think I felt any wind. So it kind of just went and then it was kind of came and then went. Because of how wind works, there's even a chance that it wasn't even a straight plus two wind. It might have been a, a two cross winds working in tangent to try and make it a plus two wind, which would mean that this is even worse or even better than it was. 
and another factor to focus in on why I only run 22.85 other than fatigue and that is the fact that if you look at the track you can clearly see it's wet I was running into the I was running whilst it was still wet it was actually raining right now kind of kind of it's kind of hard to see but it is raining as I'm running so all of these hopefully that will tell you that it is literally raining right now but all of these are factors that would be affecting my race and the fact that even with all of this it's raining my knee buckled the wind is a bit too heavy i still managed to run 22.85 which is only a 0 0.01 difference off of what i ran five days ago so if i was able to start this start doing this new technique popping my hips earlier on so that my hips were higher i could have a longer stride length who knows what i could have done for that first hundred maybe i could have been somewhere here who knows because i know for a fact that if i started doing this earlier this person would have been challenged by me i don't think i had it in me to catch him but i feel like the guy in the back right here him he definitely would have felt me and it would have been a problem for him to run because you can just kind of see he's to him he's kind of just jogging because the other guy beat him by so much it's, it's not much of a point to do much else like, as long as he stays in front of the rest of us he doesn't really have a care in the world but you can literally see here he has about two steps on me and i could have easily made up that two steps if i was able to just start this maybe let's say at 80 70 meters which i didn't i started at about 110 so you can see how this new technique that I managed to develop, which is unrefined, should be able to lead to big growth for me when I go and hit the track in my next competition. On the 15th of July or 16th of July, one of the two. So, actually, no, sorry, 12th or 13th or 14th, one of those three numbers. I think it's the 14th of July. So, which is next week. So if I'm able to do that, we could see really fast times, even though my knee is still injured. It's just a question of how fast can I go now? Not so much do I have the technique to do it. And based off of this, this race set me up really well for understanding what I needed to work on to try and run fast. Because after this, I attempted to mold my old technique with this to try and get a mesh of both because my old technique's really good seeing as it got me so far but this technique will lead me further just like how i made in one of those videos i don't know what it's called but i made a video talking about how if you don't change your technique you're going to get better using your technique but that technique has a cap so let's say you're with the current technique you have you'll be able to run a level four at best if you never change your technique and you're currently running a level six if you want to be able to PB faster, you need to improve your technique so that your potential with your current technique would improve to, let's say, 11.2, which is what we saw me do last season. But now I'd say I finally found something that would allow me to break 11, potentially in the worst conditions possible. And if that happens, I'd be very happy and I can't wait to see what happens in my next race. Till next time.